country called Jordan. Uh, there are some ruins in Jordan I wanted to see for a long time. And I'm very fortunate to have been able to identify an African community in the capital of Jordan, a, a, play, a city called Amman. I'm very excited about that. I've got, I know the community now, and I have somebody who's going to take me there, an African who's going to introduce me to the black people of Jordan. I come back to the United States, and I do a few talks in Michigan. And then I take off, and I escort a group of African Americans, Africans in America, to Cambodia and Vietnam. So that's my life right now. I love what I do, but it's very demanding. Uh, so if you see me, just take a seat and sit and talk. <laughs> Don't be shocked, because one learns to pace oneself as time goes along. Otherwise, one does not exist. And that's going to be easy anyway, because today's presentation is going to be, like most of my presentations, a slide presentation. Um, I'm going to be showing visuals. I brought two carousels. Now, some of you all have seen me before. And of course, when you, again, when you're mentioning the people responsible for bringing you here, you always inadvertently leave people out. You know, Baba Heru has already talked about Praxis and the African Rights and Passage Organization, but I would be remiss if I did not mention individually Brother Percy White, who is also a key factor in this whole thing. People have seen me speak before, and I almost always do visuals. Well, this time, I decided that I was going to do a whole new presentation. So during January, I spent a lot of money to get a lot of brand new 35 millimeter slides. And it will probably be the last time I do that, because everything seems to be digitized now, and people are going into a PowerPoint mode. But I'm going to do, <laughs> well, perhaps one of the last times, an old-fashioned slide presentation. Now, some of the young people who are here have seen me in their schools over the last week. And a few of the slides you will have seen, but a lot of them are going to be brand new. And some of these pictures, I know for a fact, have never been published in any book anywhere. So it should be a very good presentation, and it's free of charge. Okay? So there's no excuse. It's not snowing. It's not raining outside. At least it wasn't when I came in. So we're going to turn off the lights, and Brother Lawrence, who I consider one of my students now, um, is going to use the slide projector, operate it. I wonder if it's possible we can get every light turned off, even the ones on the stage. Y'all ain't afraid to be in the dark, are you? Most of us are in the dark anyway. We just don't know it. We're already in the dark. Now, a lot of... Um, my work has, I uh, was talking to Brother Gary Young, who is quite a collector and a, a scholar and a researcher in his own right here in Philly. Um, a, lot of this, a lot of you may know me. I had an introduction, in a sense, through working with Dr. Ivan Van Sertum in the 1980s. I was in Los Angeles at the time. I worked at Compton College. And we would bring Ivan out every, every year, sometimes two or three times a year. And then I began to travel a lot, especially in the late 1980s. I went to India for the first time. And then um, in the 90s, I started to travel to Egypt with Dr. Ben. And then I went a few times on my own. I took a group there last year. Uh, and then in this decade, in this millennium, I've traveled almost constantly. I almost never unpack a bag. Okay. And that's probably why I'm divorced twice, because I never slow down. But this is my work. It's my life. And I love what I do. So today, what I'm going to do, for the most part, is just show you some of the images that I've been collecting over the last year and a half, two years in particular. And one of the places that I've been to a whole lot, I think 15 times now, is Europe. And I go to Europe not because I like Europeans. I go to Europe because you do have an African presence there, and you have the African presence in the museums of Europe. For example, this piece right here takes me to uh, the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford University. I think the British probably stole better than any other Europeans. There's probably more of our stuff in the UK than any other part of the world. In October, I went back to England and I lectured and I also went to several different cities that I had not been to before. I went to Oxford, I went to Cambridge, 
I also went to Wales for the first time, and I went to Scotland looking for the African presence. This year I'm going to go back, but I'm also going to go to Ireland this time. And we're not going to leave any stone unturned. Uh, this one is called the Scorpion King. And what you see is a vase. Actually, it's a mace head. And um, you see a king here with a crown on, and there's a big scorpion in front of his face. And this is, I guess, the image that inspired the movie, The Scorpion King with the Rock. At least they got somebody dark in there. I guess Rock is a black man, right? OK, good. It's kind of hard to tell. But anyway, he didn't look like John Wayne. And that's a step in the right direction. So let's go to the next slide. This takes us to the, um, the pre-dynastic period. And this is the very end of the phase that ushers in the period of the pharaohs. Now, this is a photograph that my tour guide in Egypt gave me when I was there in May. We hit it off quite well. His name was Walid Ekram. And um, this is one of the images he gave me. And this is Hormakit or the Great Sphinx. And this is the closest close-up I've ever seen. Now, you've seen this monument many times, I know. It has the body of the lion and the head of the king. But I am pretty much willing to bet you that you haven't seen this one before. Now, the history tells us that this was damaged on more than one occasion, initially by a group of white slaves in Turkey called Mamluks. And then the most notorious example comes during the time that Napoleon Bonaparte, the emperor from Corsica in France, went to Egypt in 1798 and trained his artillery on the face of this monument. Now, what I found out, even the last time I was in Egypt, I was surprised to find out just for the first time. In fact, I even saw, for the first time, some of the fragments from the face of Hormagan in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. They're right there. Anybody can see them. I think they're not labeled, though, so if you don't know what you're looking at, you just see a mass of stone. And some of the rest of it is in the basement of the British Museum in London. But if you just look at these lips, that should tell you the whole story right there. Let's go to the next one, Lawrence. This one is from a museum. Where did I get this from? This is either in Copenhagen, Denmark, or it's in Leiden in Holland. I forget which, because I went to both uh, countries on the same trip. And this is from uh, the Pyramid Age. Now, you will notice if you haven't already, because I know a lot of you all are very well read and very knowledgeable, that many of these have the noses either missing or partially damaged. And one of the theories is, I think Chancellor Williams talked about it in his magnificent destruction of black civilizations, that this was done by people who invaded Egypt much later. Prince Badar and I have had some very interesting discussions about the noses on the people, uh, the noses on the statue. And I hope I hope and pray that you get a chance to go to his tour of the University Museum today. Nobody does it like him. I, he gives a very refreshing perspective, with the idea being, from what I understand, is that you cannot understand ancient Egypt unless you understand contemporary Africa. And that part of our problem is we have a tendency to use European sources. Even the best of our scholars have a tendency to use European sources for an understanding of African phenomena. And it just doesn't work that way. Anyway, it seems to me that the ones with the noses knocked off makes them look even more Africoid. Let's go to the next one. Now, this is an image. It's not the sharpest in the world. But I went to great lengths to photograph this because it was behind a piece of glass. And I'm not a great photographer. And so the problem is it was poorly lit. You couldn't use a flash. And it was behind a piece of glass, so it was almost impossible not to get some glare. But I have looked for this piece for 20 years. I found this in a book when I worked at Compton College. I think it was called Middle Kingdom Art. Middle Kingdom Art being the middle phase in dynastic Egyptian history or Kemetic hist uh, Egyptian. Let me slow down. It covers the period from around 2000 BC to about 1700 BC. And traditional Egyptologists call that the Middle Kingdom. And I found a copy of this in a black and white book, and I wanted to see the actual piece. So I had to go all the way to Edinburgh in Scotland to photograph this. This is in the, um, 
I think it's the Royal Museum of Scotland. Let's go to the next one. That man's name is...